So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, more than half a century ago, on Boxing Day, December 26th, 1966, just like many years before that, most North Americans were busy buying frivolous stuff. Uh, but in Washington, D.C., a professor of medieval history at University of California addressed the annual meeting of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. And in doing so, he set off an intellectual explosion. His comments and allegations changed the ecological discourse from technological problem to a religious problem. That person was Lynn Townsend White Jr. He was a professor of medieval history at Princeton and Sanford universities. And he spoke on historical roots of our ecological crisis. So he said that all forms of life modify their contacts, which is very simple, we all know. If we are on this earth, somehow we have some influence on ecology. He also said that humans' relationship with nature was always dynamic and interactive. Nothing new there. We all know about it, he knew about it. Those are statements of facts. Then he went on to say that industrial revolution was the fundamental turning point in ecology. Why? He said that because the mentality changed. Mentality changed to earth was a resource for human consumption. And that increased the ability to exploit, overexploit, and destroy the environment. He went on to say that what people do about their ecology depends on what they think about themselves in relation to things in their environment. That was Professor Lynn Townsend White. He claimed that our religious influence in Middle Ages was the root cause of the environmental crisis of the 20th century and beyond. And he said that we shall continue to have worsening economic crisis, sorry, ecological crisis, until we reject the axiom that nature has no reason to exist save to serve men. So people asked him, on what grounds can you say that religion influenced the ecological crisis? And he pointed to Genesis chapter 1, paragraph 26. And in it, it says, and God said, let us make man of our image after our likeness and let them have, let them have dominion over fish of the sea and over the fall of the air and over cattle, etc., cetera, etc." Cetera. So Lynn Townsend White concluded that the solution to the ecological crisis is not science, it's not technology, but change in fundamental ideas about nature. And he said that we must abandon the superior attitude that makes us willing to use the earth for our slightest whim. Then he said something explosive. He said, since the root of our troubles are largely religious, the remedy must also be essentially religious. That was a polite way of him saying that you created the problem, religions, now you better fix it. He said something that people believed in those days, talked in private, but Lynn Townsend White Jr. found the courage to say it aloud and in public. Ladies and gentlemen, these were fighting words in those days and brought religion into the environmental struggle. This was a wake up call. And theologians in those days reevaluated their, their traditions. Classic texts were reread and reinterpreted. Scholars argued that instead of dominion, the Genesis promotes stewardship. Religious readers were uh, started to promote their religion as green or environmentally friendly or eco-friendly. So what was the result? 
Well, a lot of talk, but no action. A lot of academic talk and discussions, but nothing happened. Life continued without much change. And at best, the world religions uh, promoted themselves as environmentally friendly and uh, environment as one of their responsibilities, but much at a lower scale. But the environmental duties remain significantly less important than religious duties. Till Braun Taylor come to stage. 24 years later, Braun Taylor uh, came to stage. He was a, a professor of religion and nature at University of Florida. And he announced the rise of a new movement, dark green religion. A new religion, he said, very different from established religions. So Braun, Braun uh, Taylor said that dark religion uh, preaches nature is sacred, imbued with intrinsic value and worthy of reverent care. He said that non-human species have worth, they matter. And he said that ethics of kinship between human beings and other forms is very important. He went on to say that dark green religion possesses many of the characteristics of established religions. It has sacred texts like Walden uh, by Henry David Thoreau that promotes simple living in natural surroundings. If you have not read that book, I would strongly urge you to do that. It's, it's an excellent, excellent piece of work. He said that there are prophets of this dark green religion. There's a, a, a gentleman called John Moyer who said that all the world seems a church and the mountains are its altars. He argued that there is no need to go to a place of worship. I can find God in nature. Wherever I am, I can find him. Rachel Carson, she said that, but man is a part of nature and this war against nature is inevitably a war against himself. Braun Taylor went on to say that eventually their religions, meaning established religions, are likely to be replaced by naturalistic form of nature spirituality. This was a warning from Braun Taylor that inaction is going to bring about a new religion. So you better do something about it. Then came Arne Ness. He's a Norwegian philosopher who came up with the concept of deep ecology, a social movement backed by a holistic vision of the world. And he argued that we should restructure our human societies to live with this philosophy. So that brought about a new crop of eco-theologians who have taken up this cause. Reverend Michael Dowd, a pro-future evangelist. So he professes the new concept of theology. He says ecology is theology. He says big history is creation story. He says evidence is scriptures. There's author Leah Shade, and she equips preachers to interpret scriptures with green lenses and become rooted in environmental theologies. So this is breath of fresh air, new perspective, new and more practical and more relevant religious preachings. So are these new concepts really? Are they revolutionary teachings? Is the concept of dark religion revolutionary or is it recycled? Was it preached before? Was it practiced by our ancestors? Is it still practiced by some amongst us? Let us examine the Zoroastrian answer to dark green and deep ecology. So in Zoroastrianism, Aura Mazda, the Lord of Wisdom and his Amishaspant archangels and their helpers, Yezidas or the angels are personification of elements of nature. You will see this in, on, in this chart. 
Our Mazda looks after mankind, Bama looks after animals, Adibis looks after fire, and so on. Spiritually, each Amesha Aspen is assigned an element of nature. Polluting or mistreating nature results in displeasing or insulting the divine. And in our scripture, Shaiest Nashaiest, it goes on to say, whoever teaches care of these seven creations does well and pleases the bounteous immortals. Then his soul will never arrive at kinship with hostile spirit. When he has cared for the creations, the care for these bounteous immortals is for him. And he must teach this to all mankind in the material world. Nature has its spiritual masters. Amesha Aspans and Yazats. Humans are not its masters or owners. That's what Zoroastrianism says. Our calendar, each day of Zoroastrian calendar is special. It is just not a number. It is dedicated to Amish husbands and Yazaks. Each day and each month means something, says something, communicates something, it conveys something, it declares something. For example, the environmental experts and scientists tell us to consume less meat for our health and for the benefit of the environment. Well, our ancestors have been pr practicing this for generations. The day of Bhaman and, the, and its co-workers, Mor, Ghosh, and Ram are dedicated to animals. The entire month of Bhaman is dedicated to animals. So the observant Zoroastrians will refrain from consuming meat on those days in the entire month of Bhaman. That is 78 days in a year, 21% of the year. 21% of the year, Zoroastrianism teaches us to remain vegetarian. If you remain more, it's, it's excellent. Likewise, the months of Ardibesh is dedicated to fire, month of Ava is dedicated to water, month of Asfan is dedicated to earth, month of Amardar to vegetation and so on. So in our Sanchai calendar today, January 10, 2021, is Zamyat Roach, dedicated to earth. Amardat Ma, dedicated to plants. So today is the day dedicated to earth and to plants. We have to be mindful of that. Our secular calendar, we celebrate 22nd April as Earth Day. In Zoroastrian calendar, each day is an Earth Day. Now we look at Asha. The meaning of Asha is complex, and in today's context, it means divine law, nature's law. Nature has bound the entire world by a divine law. Laws of gravity, laws of physics, laws of chemistry, laws of planetary motions, and so on and so forth. Nothing can change the law of Asha. No meditation, no prayer, no repentance, no sacrifice can change it. No prophet can mediate, intervene, or suspend these laws. Nature's laws and justice is blind and fair to all. Nature delivers swift and impartial justice. No need for a lawyer, no need for a court, no need to go to a judge to interpret the law. Nature is the judge, jury, and executioner. Its law is supreme. So do not mess with nature and its divine law. Environmental degradation is talked about in Zoroastrianism. In Vanidat, Bhargara III describes how earth is to be treated and elements to be kept pure. It prescribes hygiene, punishment to polluters, treatment of corpses, purity laws, treatment of dogs and other animals, and much, much more. Our ancestors have been practicing Dokminashini in its functioning form, the most environmentally friendly method of disposal of corpse. If we look at Ardaiviraf Nami, Ardaiviraf was the Mobit who went to heaven, who visited heaven and hell, and came back and told us what it is like. So in his Nami, in his writings, he says this, those who have abused the domestic animals are most 
uh, uh, tortured in hell. Those who treated them with respect and kindness were rewarded in paradise. Now the prayers. Zoroastrian prayers do much more than praise our Mazda. They talk to us. They instruct us. They advise us. They guide us. They tell us how to live a good life. Special Zoroastrian prayers are dedicated to elements of nature, fire, water, sun, moon, etc. Yesna ceremony, very important ceremony. But before we go to Yesna ceremony, let's look at the uh, Chardi Sano Namaskar. It goes on to say, Nemo Vanga, Masangamcha, Shoitana Namcha, Gayoitana Namcha, Maitana Namcha, and go on. It says that homage to those places and those lands and for those pastures and those abodes with, with their hay racks and for the water, land and plants and for their earth and for their heaven and for the usher owing wind and for the stars, the moon and the sun and for the eternal stars without beginning and self disposing and for all the usher owing creatures of Spentamenium, male and female regulators of Asha. The entire prayer has no mention of God, you would have noticed. It only speaks of nature and homage to nature. And we, see this, we say these prayers uh, in each direction, east, west, north, and south. Yesna, Yesna ceremony, an inner liturgical ceremony performed by our Mobits is dedicated to nature. The aim of Yesna ceremony is to maintain the cosmic integrity of good creations of our Mazda. In this ceremony, natural elements are used to consecrate Abizor, and the ceremony ends with returning a part of the Abizor to where it came from, to nature. It signifies the interconnectedness of that that is natural. A reminder to humans, as it is said in Genesis, for dust you are, and to dust you will return. So in that prayer in Yasna, chapter one, paragraph 12, goes on to say, Nive diemi hankaremi, tava atro vrimazda putra, mat vispebio atrebio, nive diemi hankaremi, aibio vangubio, vispanamcha apam mazadatanam, vispanamcha urvaranam mazadatanam. It says, I announce and carry out this Yasna for you. O fire, son of our Mazda, together with all the fires and for the water, even for all the waters made by Mazda and for all the plants which Mazda made. The Yasna ceremony, ladies and gentlemen, amongst other things, is dedicated to nature. It's for nature. Now, Jashan ceremony. Well, seven aspects of nature are represented in this ceremony to make participants conscious of their interconnectedness to them. Amishaspans and Yazids are invited during this ceremony. Kusti prayers. We face sun during the day and source of light after sunset. Again, we face nature. Ashivad ceremony, instructions to newlyweds. Well, it says that keep water clean, cultivate land, plant trees and plants, and do not cut down young trees. Give herbs and medicine to the needy. Everything relates to nature. Our Patet Pasemani, Kardo 8, repentance of sin, goes on to say, Azamoin Harain Guna. Harain margazam, harain fraudmad, harain manid, harain guna asguna. If I have committed any sins that are margazam, deserving death, any confirmed, left unatoned, or any other sins, I repent and I promise not to do them again. Well, these sins could be against humans, animals, fire, metal, earth, water, trees, and vegetation. 
So mistreating and not respecting nature is a sin in Zoroastrianism. Here we repent for it. Our celebrations. So Zoroastrian New Year is a special significance. Day of vernal equinox, 21st of March of each year. When nature wakes up from its winter sleep, when beautiful first flowers start blossoming, when greenery returns to the landscape, when the weather turns warmer, the birds start singing and the animals wake up from their hibernation. When the nature and the environment renews itself, Zoroastrians renew themselves with Navruz, new day, new year. This is living with nature in harmony. We also have gumbars. All of our gumbars are aligned with seasons, with nature. Jasane Sadeh, Jasane Meragan, all those events are aligned with nature. So about 150 years ago, ladies and gentlemen, let's go back in time. 150 years ago in late 19th century, it must have been Ava Rose and Ava Ma, the month dedicated to water and the day dedicated to water. And our ancestors, richly dressed, were gathered on a beach to observe Ava Nuparak and to serve Ava Yazad, the divinity of water. They noticed an American approaching them in wonderment and inquiring as to what was happening. They welcomed him to be a part of their celebration. This American was Andrew Carnegie, industrialist, philanthropist, and a world traveler. He was on his world tour. So he observed this special happening and he wrote in his book. He said that it was the first of the moon here on the shores of the ocean as the sun was sinking they congregated to perform their religious rites. Fire was there in its grandest form, the setting sun, the water in the vast expanse of Indian Ocean stretched before them. The earth was under their feet and wafted across the sea, the air came laden with perfumes. Surely no time or place could be more fitly chosen for lifting up the souls to the realm of, of realms beyond sense. I could not but participate in what was so grandly beautiful. I have seen many modes of uh, worship, some disgusting, some saddening, a few elevating, but all in poor to this, nor do I ever expect to witness a ceremony which will so powerfully affect me as that of the Parsis on the beach of Bombay. This was Andrew Carnegie and he wrote about ancestors. So these were our ancestors. They were in tune with nature. That's what they did. So it is understandable that, that Professor John Hennels of University of London describes Zoroastrianism as the world's first ecologically conscious religion. So fellow Zoroastrians with this pedigree of our religious teachings and our customs and practices, I would urge and argue that we are held at a higher standard of care for the environment. The question we have to ask ourselves, are we living up to it? Well, the answer lies in a note that we received from our mother. I'm not sure whether you got that note or not. Maybe it went in your junk email, but we got a note from our mother. And the note says, clean up your mess. Clean up your mess. That's our mother earth telling us. And if that is the answer we are getting from our mother, then we have to reevaluate how we live. So let us remember Braun Taylor's warning. We have a religious responsibility. So in response to the ecological challenges, and pressure to act. World's religious leaders have issued proclamations on climate crisis. They have signed letters, made formal statements, made petitions to politicians, supported some climate initiatives, 
Parliament of World Religion have issued statement of environmental responsibility. The question is, are religious proclamations of, of caring for God's creation or having compassion for all beings sufficient? Is it okay? Is it that's all we can do? Let their result be their answer. The critics call them cosmetic. So what do we do as Zoroastrians? We have a special responsibility, a higher degree of care. The first and foremost, let's listen to science. I have some news for you, ladies and gentlemen. God is not coming down to earth and waving a magic, magic wand to take away all the environmental problems. No major miracle cure. So we have collective responsibility. Renewable energy, clean energy, sustainable energy, collective sacrifice for environment. We have to sacrifice to get this collective responsibility carried out. We need to get involved. We have individual responsibility, a basic principle of Zoroastrianism, individual responsibility. Take responsibility, examine our lives, I urge you, maybe I can go one step forward and say, I challenge you to make your life more environmentally conscious. Let's do it. Let's start with looking at our garbage, something that we put away every week on the curbside and it disappears and we don't think about it anymore. But that's something that we need to think about the most, garbage. How much do we produce? And what is in our garbage? Plastic, our experts tell us, science tells us that it takes about 400 to 1,000 years to decompose the plastic. So if you take that premise, the plastic that was produced on this earth for all that many years is still sitting there undecomposed. It's still there. We are running out of place, landfill and all other places to store them. So landfills pollute earth. And we are upsetting, we are insulting. Uh, Asfandad and Zamiat, those are the Amish Asfand and Yazad who are responsible for land. And we are dumping them in the sea, polluting water. And we are insulting and upsetting our Yazad. That's a female Yazad. We cannot be doing that. Food, well, let's look at our food consumption. We should use food with less environmental effect, reduce meat consumption. By doing that, we will be pleasing Bhaman Yazad. For health and environment, uh, go meat free on Pareji days. Pareji days are days that are dedicated to Bhaman more goes Ram and the month of Burman. Let's swap, swap our plastic disposable water bottles, straws and cutlery for reusable plastic single use bags to use reusable cloth bags, long distance food to locally grown or buy local food, cars to bikes and electric cars eventually. And ladies and gentlemen, you might also consider going zero waste. Take it up as a weekly challenge, a week where you, where you create no waste. It's difficult, but at least we should try. Be mindful of world population. All the natural elements will thank you. They are overburdened with too many people. Celebrate nature, Navroz, Gambars, Jashans. So let us use the most powerful tool that we have been blessed with in an open and free society, our vote. The vote we cast every four years, but also the vote that we cast every day when we shop and make economic decisions. So let us vote with our credit card. You know, when you use your credit card, actually, 
you are using two credit cards. It's just that you don't see the second credit card. So as you use your credit card and pay for it, you usually think, do I have enough limit? Can I afford it? Do I have enough money in my bank account? Well, that's your regular credit card. But the invisible credit card is equally important. And that is nature's credit card. Can nature afford it should be the question. Does nature have enough limit should be the question. So next time when you go out to buy something, as you use your credit card, please ask that question. I can afford it. Can nature afford it? And if nature cannot afford it, you are not to purchase that item. We also have spiritual responsibility to our Mazda, to our husbands, to Yazids, who are personification of nature's elements. So ladies and gentlemen, now are there, are these, are these not the most modern teachings? Teachings that apply to our present day issues. These are Zoroastrian teachings. So the religious answers that Braun Taylor was looking for and Arnie Ness has proposed are hidden in Zoroastrian scriptures, practices, and beliefs. Let the treasure of Zoroastrian teachings be available for the benefit of humankind. Thank you and may our Mazda guide us on the right, on the path of righteousness. Thank you. Emton, thank you so much for the very inspiring talk. Uh, we have a few questions for you. Uh, thank you. Can I start? Yes. So the first question is, environmental problems are in large part due to the overpopulation and consequently overuse of resources followed by pollution. And you talked about the industrial re revolution that started all this. So the question is, shouldn't the answers come from science and our politicians who can put in regulations? And how can Zoroastrianism help answer these questions? Excellent. See, the, 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 it's important to realize that we have come to this stage because industrial revolution made it possible. It made it possible. It made items in abundance that we can consume. But as Lynn Townsend White said, it's the mentality that brought us to this level, meaning that we can, yes, certainly it's nice to consume things that, are, that make our lives easier, uh, more fruitful, more livable, uh, etc. But there should be a limit to it. We cannot keep on consuming as if there is no tomorrow. We cannot keep on doing things that are uh, harmful to environment without any regard for it. So we have to be mindful of that. As our uh, prayers tell us that, that we have to revere, we have to worship, we have to be mindful, we have to be, we have to be uh, 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 purposeful for the environment. And there are Yazids and Amishasmans that are dedicated to those, those uh, uh, items. And therefore, therefore, we should be mindful of that and we should, we should, we should uh, be respectful. So now the question then arises, is, that question, is the environmental issue only dedicated and responsible, is the only responsibility of, of science? Well, to a considerable extent, it is but it is also the responsibility of a religion. The reason I say that is science can bring all sorts of solutions to our problems. If people do not follow them, if people do not comply with them, if people do not respect them, if people do not consider them to be worthy of, of following and, and, and implementing, then those answers, those solutions will not work. So let's see how we can, we can make these things work. And look at the power that religions have. Well, 
there look at look at the scenario somebody doesn't like a book a cartoon somebody doesn't like a cartoon and that person has the power to bring out millions of people on the street cause so much property damage kill a few people not a problem threaten and uh, uh, the uh, uh, elected officials of countries just because they didn't like a book or a cartoon that's the power of religion let's see what they have done for the environment can we not use the same power to tackle the environmental problem so we can blame the technology we can look at them we can try and get answers from them but implementing those is the most important part and that can be easily done through religion thank you tentan uh, can i go through a couple of more questions yes please so the second question is do religion do religions have the resources to affect change in nature and why can't god intervene somehow to fix these ecological problems because if god is great then all these issues should be self fixed so to speak yes well as i said god is not going to come down and wave a magic wand and get things better it's not going to happen zoroastrianism tells us so in our basic prayers kem namazda it says where do i look for help who will help me when there is a natural calamity when there is somebody looking at me with an evil eye when there are problems who will help me and the prayer does not say that oh i will come down and i will do something it does not say that i will send somebody to fix your problems no it says that you use your good mind and the fire you have to use your good mind figure the problems out figure the answers out and use your mind and use the others the nature the, the the elements of nature and try and come up with a solution if we create the problems why would we rely on god to come and fix it so it's important for us to come up with an answer god is not going to come down and as far as zoroastrianism goes of course we have quite a few answers how to live a good life how to respect nature how to revere nature how to make sure that we do not pollute those are all items written in our scriptures all we need to do is to look it up and live them but more importantly to spread that message let people know that we have these answers here let people know that this is the environmental uh, religion that respects environment let people know that we can make a change in the world through zoroastrianism so tenton that's very inspiring and i have a suggestion before i have a couple of other questions my suggestion would be for you to have a one or two page memo that can be sent out to all our atashkades so our children can learn this from day one so how what they can do about their carbon footprint from when they are very young i think that would be very useful if you can do that suggestion well taken thank you okay a couple of more questions so <clears throat> this is about how we should dispose our old sudre pushtis and prayer books so we are typically told this is a, this was a question uh, that we should put old kastis old pushtis or garebans in water and burn prayer books how should we dispose those items okay so the kusti and what do we do with them once we once we are done with the kustis well our ancestors were very wise maybe they were not scientists maybe they didn't have phd's on different things but they were smart enough to figure out what to do with things so the kusti needs to go in water we may think think that it pollutes water uh there was a gentleman who did a study and then he found that when you put the kusti in water what is kusti made of small natural product it goes in the in the system fish eat it up and it goes back in the environment it does not pollute 
It's nature itself. We are not changing the structure. It's not like we are changing uh, petrochemical to uh, 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 plastic, and that's not biodegradable. Kasi is biodegradable. Okay. Now, with regard to um, the prayer books, etc., not necessarily you need to you need to uh, 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 burn a book. Uh, you could certainly recycle it somehow. But burning a book again, it, it, as, as long as you do it with respect, it's 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 made out of wood. It's made out of wood chips. Again, it goes back to nature. So yes, our ancestors figured those things out. They knew that that's, that was the best way of disposing them. Thank you. I, I think you're right. Anything that's organic should um, be disposed over time. Okay, question, next question. So we've heard of uh, the equation I is equal to PAT, where I stands for impact and PAT stands for pollution, affluence, and technology. Do you think this equation is true? And can you elaborate on that? Yes, I equals PAT is an equation. And that is very important and very enlightening in today's environment. So the impact is a result of population, affluence, and technology. When you bring these three things together, there is going to be an impact on the environment. Population is a big problem in today's environment. You know, we were only about a billion people in 1804. So it took millions of years from the start of this earth, millions of years to, for people to be a billion. In 1804, then we became two billion, double, in 1927. That's about 123 years. It took 123 years for us to become a billion to two billion, double, 123 years. Then we became 3 billion in 1960. That's only 33 years from then. So in next 33 years, we became another billion. And we added another billion in 1974, 14 years. We went again to 5 billion within the next 13 years, another billion. So it's unbelievable pace of growth, a billion people in 12 years. And that even is faster now. So when we were about 7 billion in 2017, in 2020, we are at 7.8 billion. So population growth is so high. You add to it the affluence Industrial revolution has given us the affluence. We can afford more things. Our ancestors could not. Now we can afford so much more. We can afford bigger houses, two cars, uh, 100 pieces of clothing, etc., etc., which our ancestors did not. So that's affluence. And the T technology. There is technology to make things happen. So if we consume more, if we can afford more, and if we are more people, just imagine the total consumption and the consumption is gone out of hand. And that is creating this environmental problems. So the impact is significant because of these three factors. If we can reduce one of them, population, population, that impact could be curtailed. So it is important for us to look at this equation and work at it. Sorry, I was speaking to myself. Okay. So Temtan, I know we have only a couple of more minutes left. So a couple of people are pointing towards forming a group, a Zoroastrian group where we can work together to propagate this idea about how our religion can help mankind and reduce the footprint, carbon footprint in the world. Do you have any thoughts about that? 
that would be excellent if somebody could uh, could uh, could put it together uh, and we can communicate we can declare to the world that we have this treasure with us it's available to anyone who wants it it's there for people to learn and respect and it's there for people to benefit out of if we have it and if we don't share it with people and don't announce it then we are guilty of neglect and i don't think we should be guilty of that so certainly that, that is an excellent excellent idea and if we can form a group to 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 propagate uh, the zoroastrian way of looking at environment uh, then that certainly should be done emtan i think right on the dot this was an excellent talk very inspiring and um, again we continue to thank everyone for joining us please let us know what you think about our talks we would like to uh, make it better in any way we can and we hope that you'll join us again next month thank you all again thanks temtan